if you're the best ever at delivering this service or your product is better than anything else, if you don't have any customers, it doesn't matter. And so a lot of time people go, they're only good at marketing, but their stuff is crap. I would never want to be that person. Mm -hmm. And that, that might be true. But the, the reality is they're dismissing someone that probably has a lot to teach them. There are people that are not creating any value that are becoming incredibly wealthy. And then we see people that they might posthumously win the Nobel Prize, but they weren't known in their lifetime because they couldn't do it. And so I look up and as a business person, I hope you got into this business, not just to make money, but to make an impact. This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and flow chart with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf and Joe Fair. Hey. Hey, hey, we are back for another episode. Today, we're actually chatting with one of the co-authors of The One Thing book. His name is Jay Papasan, and he works right alongside with Gary Keller, who's the founder of Keller Williams Realty. So Jay actually serves as vice president of the learning of that company. He brings in all different perspectives from not only writing books, but lead generation to time blocking, goal design, all that stuff. Jay is amazing. He comes from a writing background, has traveled the world to do so has worked with Bill Phillips in the health space to write some books, you know, Body for Life. He has also worked with Mia Hamm uh, to write her book, Go for the Goal. But really, um, this is just going to be a fascinating conversation. Jay is an amazing guy, and you're going to get a ton from this. So let's not waste any time. We're going to take a bunch of notes for you. We always do. They are the action guides for each episode. So you can get those by going to flowchartgroup.com we're making a little change so when you join our facebook group you'll you'll get the opportunity to get the notes for free so just be quick make sure it's two weeks from the time this episode goes live if you go to flowchartgroup.com you'll get the notes so you don't have to take them they're all the action notes and then lastly we have hrefs so hrefs is our go-to seo tool been using them for years, way before the sponsorship. And yeah, there's just so many ways to use Ahrefs. I love to dig in there and really look at the site audit. I actually was chatting with a friend the other day, a photographer, and I asked her, hey, how's business going? She's like, it's actually, I'm crushing it right now because I started focusing on my SEO. She's been around for 10 years and just didn't focus on SEO, wasn't showing up for anything. She started putting a little bit of time into her on-page SEO and then all of a sudden started climbing the ranks. And that was on the first page for a lot of terms. And I was like, you should check out Hrefs, do a site audit, look for the opportunities. And there's all these different strategies that Hrefs actually teaches you on their blog and on YouTube. And she's starting to do that and she's already seen a ton of opportunities. And I was like, start plugging your competition in there and she's like, oh my God, I could beat my competition. I'm like, well, yeah, because you could be smarter than your competition and just do tiny little tweaks to your existing website and you can actually get monumental improvements and targeted free traffic. So she's doing it and you can do that with Ahrefs because that's what she's using. That's what I suggested her to do and it's working. Go try it out for yourself. If you go to ahrefs.com, that's ahrefs.com. EFS.com. That's Ahrefs. They have a $7 seven day trial. You can actually, within that seven days, just try out that site audit. You can see what I'm talking about. Find some opportunities. You'll love it. Let's get into this episode and start chatting with Jay Papazan. Hey, Jay. We're live. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thanks. for. I mean, we've had you on and just had Jeff Woods on as well, who, I mean, you guys are just, I don't know how closely you guys work on the day to day, but brilliant guy and just opened our minds to so many that, you know, from the one thing, but just his perspective around, uh, you know, goal setting and time blocking. And I know you have a whole, you know, you, <laughs> I, I don't know how different your approach is, but it's going to be great to hear your approach and how that relates to the other amazing stuff you're up to, KW, Keller Williams. And well, uh, Jeff and I, I, we've gotten a chance to work together for a little, I guess, a little over five years now. Yeah. Um, I hired him to help launch that business that he's currently running for Gary and I. And um, he literally works on the other side of that wall, except that he's moving to Colorado today. So oh, he'd mentioned we're going. That. Yes. We discovered he... we can all have a virtual business now, right? Yeah. Go figure. I think a lot of companies are figuring that out right now. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, give us this. I mean, because you have an interesting background and I uh, don't even know where to perfectly start here, but walk us through kind of briefly and then we'll kind of lead into these topics we were talking about um, that I think is going to be really good takeaways, different from to folks listening who've heard Jeff on here. It'll be slightly different and modified for, uh, you know, for you, of course. So, 
Okay, so yeah. the I, I bump into someone at a cocktail thing, like what who what do you do? Question yeah, is yeah, this like just, a little history? Yeah. All right. Um I kind of got my professional start in book publishing. Um, I went and was lucky. I had some connections and I got a job at HarperCollins Publishers after mm -hmm. a small publisher and got to work there for about six years mm -hmm. and got to work on some big books. Um, Mia Hamm, I got to work with her. I got to work uh, with Civil Shepherd and got to work with this guy named Bill Phillips. He did a book called Body for the Life, Body yeah. for Life, mm -hmm. which at the time I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm having to work on this kind of like a weightlifter book. <laughs> but he was brilliant and a brilliant marketer too, by the way. So I learned a lot of great lessons and uh, then met my wife, got married. Um, we wanted to get out of the big city because that's a publishing. If you don't know this, it's a high prestige job that doesn't pay you very much. Right. <laughs> so you got to meet cool people, but you, they don't pay you a lot, right? It's a bunch of English majors that are nerding out on words um, <laughs> until you get to the top level. So we wanted to raise a family somewhere else. We moved to Austin, Texas. And um, after a brief stint as a freelance writer, um, where I played a lot of Diablo on my computer, <laughs> I got kicked out and got a job. And I was just really nice and fortunate to take a job in a very small, um, at that time, almost a sleepy uh, real estate company called Keller Williams. Um, back then in 2000 is when I started um, as a newsletter writer, right? Wow. After having worked on million copy bestsellers, but it's Austin, there was no publishing. Mm -hmm. I was going to be a newsletter writer too, not even a newsletter writer one, right? <laughs> um, but it was only 27 employees in Keller Williams then, and there were 6,700 agents. And uh, today, to give you perspective, we're number one by any measure in terms of like home sales and agent count. We have 175,000 thereabouts in 50 countries. Wow. Okay. Um, so it's been kind of a rocket ride. Um, and within about a year and a half, um, I found out that Gary wanted to write books. Um, I got to let him know that that was my <laughs> background. And so we partnered up and in 90 days, we wrote our first book, a career guide for real estate agents that went on to be a million copy bestseller. And from that, there's been a lot of other things we can go down, mm -hmm. launched a publishing company, um, launched a training company, and am an executive at Keller Williams in charge of learning. So that's kind of the, let's have a beer and yeah. I'll kind of tell you where do you want to <laughs> go eat now. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, yeah, Matt was, I mean, because we mentioned your, one of your real estate books, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Um, and it, you know, it, we mentioned it to a guy in our podcast, uh, mm -hmm. Sam, I always butcher his last Sam name. Sam Karamian. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it runs Big Block Realty in San Diego. And he basically is like, that's the Bible for real estate. Yeah. Everyone needs to read that thing. And even if you're not in real estate, it's for networking. It's for, you know, just collaborating with folks. So I'm like, well, the, the brilliance, and I'll say that I didn't get to, I was the writer on that project, right? Because I was like less than two years in real estate, but I was working with Dave Jinks and Gary, mm -hmm. who collectively had like 50 years of experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I look up, I get taken along for this ride. And essentially that book was, instead of being a salesperson, how do you, how do you become a business person? Mm. Right. And I'm sure it's a lot of the conversations that um, you and Matt have on your podcast, right? Growing a business. What does that take? How do we responsibly have growth that leads to net profit? Yep. These are all discussions that people just weren't naturally having. So, I mean, I was a career guy. So it was a great education for me. And I was like, whoa, my eyes are open to entrepreneurship. But um, what's great is in real estate, they just refer to it as the red book. And you talk about branding, it's like, if we just get to own red book, I'll yep. take it. <laughs> it's a win. <laughs> well, yeah. And then of course it led into, um, so, you know, the, the collaboration of you and Gary into the one thing I know, uh, came from, I think that was, uh, Gary, right. He, you guys had all these ideas and, and essentially what he passed some of those ideas to you. And then that's when you said, Hey, that's the book. Like, that's the thing we got to write about. It's, it's a whole other podcast yeah. interview about how mm -hmm. to poorly manage your career growth. But this is like my third stint running learning, right? Yeah. So I think in my first or second stint, I was running the learning department. We'd written a course. I ran it by Gary, right? Because he always comes in and he's the trainer in chief. That's his hat he loves. He loves to be a coach. He loves to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you think of this course? And it was about, and this is probably interesting for a lot of your listeners, like, how do I grow my service business so that I've earned the right to make my first hire? Mm. And if you've ever had to hire an employee, not a contractor, but like I'm, I'm paying someone's salary, right? Mm -hmm. yep. That's a, a lot of nights staring at the ceiling, right? <laughs> like, cause what if I screw up? What if I mess up? Now this person's unemployed. They depend on me. Yeah. So that was that journey. And of course, this is what y'all do. Gary's like, well, the one thing is lead generation. 
but he wrote this little essay to go at the front called The Power of One. Hmm. And you'll love this. It was all about, you've got to first be in the business of lead generation. How am I going to get new clients for my product or business? And if you don't do that well, nothing else matters. And in order to do that, you've got a time block, which hmm. is a big part of the one thing. And I, I read that it's like 14 pages, right? Handwritten in notebook. And I was like, Gary, this is a book. And he goes, I thought the same thing. So that started a five-year journey where instead of it being Gary's idea, uh, we'd already written a, a handful of national bestsellers at that point. We wanted to make sure that it wasn't an idea book. It was a research models-based book. So we spent almost five years researching and writing that book, um, which was a really, I mean, again, a great growth journey for me. Right. Well, and I'm just thinking of the opportunities and where you've you placed yourself in this whole lineage of how you've written these books, collaborated with people like Gary and, and got all this knowledge. I mean, I'm just thinking all the way back from the, you know, the, the millionaire uh, real estate investor book two years in now you're dumped with all this 50 years of knowledge in real estate. Now you have Gary over here and you're condensing that into a book that's very actionable. It's, it's not like a Bible. It's not a thick book. <laughs> it's very easy. I don't, to consider. I don't know whose office is that y'all's office or is that, Somebody says, like, I look at your bookshelf and I like, I'm like, somebody's my kind of people. If I were to pan right. around her in the back, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm a learning junkie, right? Yep. And um, one of Gary's core philosophies is about being a learning based individual, mm. right? And that really means that you're just trying to be the best version of yourself. And the best teachers are often available 24 hours a day on my Kindle or in the library or in a bookstore. And now on podcast, right? You can get access to amazing ideas. I got lucky enough to work for a self-made billionaire, which is incredible, but we all have access to those conversations. And I'm a junkie. I'll just tell you, I'm a junkie at it. That's one of the reasons I've been, I never thought I would work anywhere for 20 years. And here I am. Yeah. No, I've, I've always said that my ideal job, if I, if, if there was a career where all I got to do was sit around and learn all day, read books, listen to podcasts, watch YouTube videos on things that interested me, that's like my ideal career. I could do nothing but learn and be happy with my life. <laughs> yeah. It would be kind of engineered that with value. the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it's a value y'all share. And it's something that I share with Gary and Gary and I share with Jeff mm -hmm. um, that we just are, I don't want to say like self-improvement junkies because we're also not fad surfing. We're not always jumping on the latest, greatest, whatever but we're, we're model builders. We're mm. looking for, is there a timeless truth? Because a lot of times people mm. say, well, I've reinvented the wheel. Mm. They've just given a new spin to something that was classic and old. Sure. Right. Yeah. It, it just they've, go they've, back in time and you'll find yeah. some hints. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean there's nothing new created. It is truly rare though. And most innovations are incremental and not like super disruptive. So we can always be doing that to ourselves. And that's mm. kind of the core of that whole journey. So researching and writing books, man, my poor kids, we were driving through, uh, my wife's a real estate agent yep. and she's got a huge business, like 300 homes a year. And um, we're driving through Yellowstone with a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. And my, we're playing, would you rather? Have y'all ever been to Yellowstone? I have. I yeah. have not. It's hours and hours of driving. Like Jeez, nothing yeah. is yeah. closer than like three hours away. It's such a huge part. Yep. So you have to play games in the car. We were playing, would you rather? And my son Gus said, would you rather be trapped in an elevator with dad talking about his books <laughs> or mom talking to her clients? Uh -huh. And we just lost it. I was like, that, that, that sums us both up. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's probably similar conversations that they would find in a, <laughs> like, I know cars that I would drive with my wife as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm kind of curious, like you being, uh, you know, just just reading and, and learning all the time. Do you have any uh, strategies, best practices on how to consume? And and this might be even getting into, you know, some of the one thing type stuff and goal setting. But any tips for people like us who are consuming all the time? And yeah. you want to apply that knowledge and really, you know, apply it to something in your life that's relevant. We actually um, we wrote a course on this earlier this year, Gary and I, mm -hmm. and. Um, it is, is partially from observation. So this is kind of a, I won't say this is like scientifically proven, right? Like there's some of the stuff that I can tell you from the one thing that we've literally gone to the researchers and validated and asked the hard questions. Mm -hmm. This is very much from um, modeling what he does. It's been my life. But recently I was interviewing Gary on some books he read um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And so I went back and read them. And I can see 
the DNA of his leadership today. Like you find the paragraph and go, wow, he still talks like this. Wow. He still does this. So here's like the blueprint. If you want to be the next Gary Keller in terms of growth, um, you read books, not for knowledge, you read books for doing. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of books that are great about um, creating ideas um, and changing your paradigm, which is also important. I think of Malcolm Gladwell has helped shape my view of the world. He hasn't shaped many of my actions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? So it's a perspective change, more or less. It's just perspective. And we endeavor and we value books that can change our perspective, but it also give us a very pragmatic, practical approach to doing. Mm -hmm. So when you're reading a book, you always have to be asking, um, how does this line up with how I currently believe about X? So marketing, digital marketing, right? You're re y'all probably read tons of books. Sure. So within a few pages, you're like, all right, I've read 50 of these already. Mm -hmm. It seems like this lady or this guy is going in this direction. I can almost predict the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And what you're actually doing is looking for that one new nugget to add. What most people, like you have this knowledge in your head, most people haven't documented it. Right. So if you look through the one thing, I think we have like 50 images in there. We call those models and they can be a checklist. They can be a diagram, like a flow chart. Like this is the steps and this. We try to take a whole book or an idea. How do you do a great job interview? How do you do great digital marketing campaign? Can we break it into discrete steps, record it in a notebook? We have, I have, I'm sitting and my feet are on my stand-up desk. I'm sitting for this. I've got a chest that's probably got 40 notebooks in it. Wow. Like right? handwritten. Where handwritten everything. notes. I would, if I could go back in time and invent Evernote when I started this journey <laughs> so I could just have it all digital, sure. it would be great. Yeah. Um, someday when I'm a billionaire, I'll just hire someone to transcribe everything for there me. Who go. knows? <laughs> but I look up and you're like, oh, so what is my belief system around this? And then you're building a model for it. And every time you read a book, you're asking, is this challenge my beliefs? Does this reinforce my beliefs? Does this change my beliefs? Do you hear that? Hmm. It either challenges, whoa, this seems really smart and it's not what I currently do. Wow, this is really smart. It is what I currently do. Now I've got better evidence, better facts to support it. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, this is really close, but it's an enhancement of some kind, right? Yeah. And you're looking for those three things. If it's just pure duplication and it's not as smart as the other stuff, you just move, move on. Yeah, you've right? had you that. It's, you're already skin. doing it. Like, uh -huh. Most business books, you get 80% of the big ideas in the first 30 pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They front load it. And then you go deep, hopefully. Hopefully you go deep and it's not just a repetition of the same idea. So um, what Gary has systematically done with his life is he identified, and we have on the one thing on page 114, it's the only page number I have memorized. Like if you're using the one thing approach of identifying your number one priority and then trying to live that priority regularly, make a habit of it. Like, what is my one thing for my spirituality, for my physical health, for my personal life, for my relationships, for my job, for my business, and for my money? Hmm. And those are just the buckets that we agreed on. And y'all are business owners, right? Mm -hmm. You are partners. Yep. So y'all have what's the one thing for the business we run, right? Mm -hmm. But what is the one thing for my job in this business? And y'all probably have overlapping but different job descriptions. So that's that distinction that a lot of people don't make between their job in the business and the business. Mm -hmm. So every time you read, do you have any buckets that you have a belief system around that you're going to try to follow, right? I re you read Warren Buffett, like, do you need another money mentor? Maybe, <laughs> maybe not, mm -hmm. right? There are you, at some point you look up and you've got your profits, Right. And you'll walk with them for a long time until you can find someone who's actually demonstrably better. And then you'll go into them. Yeah. Like for me, Trout and Reese, like I'm going to struggle to find someone who's going to teach me more about the fundamentals of marketing and positioning than those two guys. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I recommend positioning in the 21 immutable laws more than any two marketing books ever because everything feels like it lays on top of those. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And someday maybe I'll, ha I'll have a new name to spout out. But that is when we talk about a process for self-improvement, you have to read, you have to reflect on what you read. And that reflection is where you're comparing your experience and your beliefs to what this person is telling you. 
And then you have to kind of codify it in your notebook, in your journal. And we try to distill it into a model. Based on this, what are the five things I, I should be doing differently or whatever? And then you have to be able to reference that the next time you read a book on that topic so that you can compare. Mm-hmm. And over time, I've been doing this for years and years, you just start to say like, so talk to me about money, Jay. Well, we created a model in the Millionaire Real Estate Investor and it's called the Path of Money. And nothing has explained it more simply than that. So I'll go back to that until something changes that perspective. Mm-hmm. And I read probably five books on finances and money every year just as, hey, if you don't know about the laws of money, you won't hold on to it even if you make it. Right. And I've seen that in real life. So that's one of the areas that I'm, as a business person, whether I, I'm, a, I'm an English French major, whether I enjoy it or not, I have to lean into it. So that's kind of a synopsis, right? We read with purpose. You're going to reflect, you're going to document, and then over time, you're going to trade or top grade those ideas. Hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. I love that. I, I think one one sort of additional thing that I, I know I do with all the, the content that I consume is for me, a big sort of important factor is to turn around and in some way reteach it, right? Either put it on a blog, put it on a podcast, get on a call with Joe and be like, hey, That's guess right. what I just learned? I need to tell you something. And like that sort of reteaching it is what makes it locked in for me. Uh, I'll, 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 I agree with that 100%. And in, in my mind, I call that like the joke factor. If you hear a really great joke and you want to remember it, what do you have to do? You, you have to go it. tell it to like yep. five people. <laughs> that's right. Start practicing. Right? Yeah. yeah, but nothing. And I love that because that's like I, my passion is the training room, right? That's the group I'm privileged to lead at this time for the third time in <laughs> Keller Williams. I'm, I'm passionate about either being in front of it or in it. But if you become the teacher, it forces you to organize the information at a higher level than you might for yourself, which is one of the best ways to learn. They always say that it sounds cliche, but it is so true. So well, I yeah. salute you on that. Matt. <laughs> that is absolutely true. And, and in the combined with what you have, you've now distilled all this information into a simple model that's on one page, just very easy to, you know, that could be sprinkled in any content anywhere, given to someone as like a, hey, you need a little help with this thing? I created a model for you. Here you go. And right. you know, it's just, it's easy to teach. You could break it down, simple to remember for everyone. I mean, that's, yeah, combining both of those, it's kind of the perfect combination. And it, and, and, and it gets more and more nuanced. In the beginning, it's really fundamental stuff. Like, do I understand in the terms of a diet, macros or calories or whatever that is? It can be really simple stuff. Hmm. And people, they get intimidated when they talk to probably both of you about digital marketing because y'all been accumulating for so long you have this amazing curse of knowledge. You don't even realize how sophisticated your thoughts appear, right? Very true. <laughs> um, but that's the, the, what should be encouraging to people is that just means that kind of like the tortoise in the hare, you didn't get there overnight. You just keep going back to the well and just making little steps and getting improving. And people would be amazed at how much they can amass over time. That's true. Um, yeah. I just would encourage people, everything doesn't matter equally. That's kind of why we created those buckets. Yeah. I want to have a rich spiritual life, right? I want to have good physical health. Cause if I'm going to do really important stuff, I got to have energy to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not um, going to be willpower, want, right? You can't push, yeah. keep pushing, pushing, pushing. Yeah. So you just look each of those buckets, right. Or whatever they're meaningful. And you know, maybe cat videos are really important to you. Fine. Then, then read methodically about that and learn methodically about whatever that placeholder is film, whatever that can be your passion. Sure. But you yeah. just need to identify it because um, I think this year, something like 650,000 business books will be written. Wow. Really? So Just this year alone? Minimum of 350. I haven't checked on the numbers in about 40 years. Uh, but it, it goes up exponentially because of self-publishing, mm-hmm. right? There are fewer and fewer borders between someone having an idea and sharing that idea. And now there's factories to help people do it. Mm. So I look up and I'm a business author. I read about... 45 books a year. I shoot for 50. I always fail, but the, the, the goal is one a week thereabouts with a couple of weeks off. And that keeps me honest. Yeah. And cool. so I look up and I'm like, I could spend my whole lifetime reading a hundred books a year. And I couldn't even read all of the business books this year. <laughs> so I have to choose. I want to be an expert about a handful of things that matter to me. And I can also be entertained. About half the books I read are novels because I just, that is my release. I just mm, want to sure. 
go imagine that I'm James Bond in my mind or whatever that adventure novel is or the mystery. I get to be Sherlock Holmes. Like, yeah, you need that too. But like about 25 are really methodical. I'm, I want to be better person. Um, even if it's for a year, it would mm. make a huge difference in your life. Just one a quarter, it would mm. make a huge difference. I think if you kids... tell I'm a little evangelistic now, like <laughs> this is a passion thing. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, if yeah. your kids listen to this interview, they would know they should probably be asking you about James Bond style video, uh, books that you read rather than <laughs> you know, all the business <laughs> stuff that you do. Um, just note to them. <laughs> I, I went through a James Rollins phase and he's like, writes these adventure books or whatever. They're, <laughs> It's, they sound good when you read them, but the first time I tried to listen to one on audiobook with my family, I started blushing. I was like, oh, this is really not good writing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. You're probably picking it apart. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, no, you're passionate about it. And I've, I don't know how deeper we want to go in this because I'm now I'm curious because obviously you have your circles and whatever those circles are defined. And I know Jeff uh, Woods did go into the circle approach a little bit on, on his episode with us. Uh, but I'm assuming, yeah, you're kind of looking at those circles and seeing where you maybe need to shore up something, maybe challenge some beliefs that you currently hold. Mm -hmm. And and you're reflecting a lot, it sounds like. It's probably the bulk of your time. So here's a question. And, Is and it, documenting it. Have y'all read Principles? Did y'all read that from, huge bestseller? Yeah. 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 Like you look at, oh, there's a self-made billionaire, and he's yeah. doing the exact same thing that Gary does. He has organized the big ideas, and he has real strong feelings about it. Hmm. And he was willing to put them on the line. Like he put it in a book. Oh, yeah. And so like, I have an Evernote and I, I started my own principles and I have, have my notebooks. I've started making it digital now, but like, Hey, like as a business person, I have to do contracts. And every time I'm signing a contract or negotiating a contract, why would I ever want to reinvent the wheel around something that important? Mm -hmm. So sure. like I've started collecting, like what are the terms that matter to me? What are the best practices? Like what about partnerships? What matters in a partnership? And so you just start to realize these are the, a lot of times, if you haven't figured this out already, they're pain points. Yeah. I screwed up bad. <laughs> it was really expensive or painful on some level. And therefore I have this strong motivation to get better, but I don't want to repeat the same mistakes. Hmm. So you just find some way, a notebook, whatever, and just kind of like, okay, hey, like yesterday I was doing a podcast with one of our employees and it was on values. And she was really struggling with the opening and struggling with the closing. And I've done a lot of training and done a lot of studying on how to be a better presenter. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I think you have book, bookend anxiety. I just made it up. And she's like, what do you mean by that? And I was like, I just wanted your attention. <laughs> I just said, it's your opening and your closing. Every time we do a podcast, you struggle. And I just said, here's a framework for you. Because I had a framework. Like, think about just yeah. doing these two things every time you start and these two things every time you open and make that your own. You can come up with your own twist, but if you're really struggling, just, I got to check these two boxes and you're going to be fine. Mm. And what most people don't have is a simple checklist for doing the most important things in their life, or they deal with periodic regular anxiety because they just haven't documented it. Mm. And just give me an idea. I'm like, man, there really should just be a list and, and, you know, referencing your thinking time, which you time block, it sounds like after certain things. And just not to give it away, but listeners, he has thinking time. <laughs> yeah, you have thinking time right after this episode, which I think is brilliant. We'll get into time blocking. But like, that's probably a perfect time to reflect and be like, okay, so what are the problems or pain points or things I might have screwed up on? Uh, just some friction that comes up. Create an ongoing list. And then those yeah. things are ways you can further reflect on and figure out solutions. Most of us are so busy, especially for the self-employed entrepreneur. Um, Keith Cunningham gets credit for the idea of thinking time. If you've read him or mm. heard him, he's brilliant. But most entrepreneurs don't time block enough of it. Just an hour a week is a miracle worker. And it's like uh, the E-Myth, if you ever read that book, mm -hmm. he talked about, are you working on your business or in it? That's right. Yeah. And just stepping back, you know, getting, hey, Matt, what can I do better? You know, yeah, like just reflecting and asking for reflection. It, it's a miracle worker. Yeah. True. At what point do you decide, like, maybe this is a belief that I should start challenging? Because I think it's really easy to go pick up books that just kind of keep us in our own echo chamber and sort of reaffirm what we already believe. So I'm just curious, is there ever a point where you're like, okay, I've, I've been kind of stuck on this mindset for so long. Let's, let's try to find some alternatives to this way of thinking. So um, I love the question and you're making me laugh because we're on the edge of one of the biggest political elections of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And we talk about 
I think one of the biggest culprits right now is that we all go to the same echo chamber that mm-hmm. reinforces our ideas. And um, so the language that I've adopted around that, um, I'm from the South. So this is a joke that's usually told about me because my family's from Mississippi. Mm-hmm. But like, if you start having a family within your family, you'll have inbred family, right? Mm-hmm. That's the most, the politest way I can say it, right? Right. right. <laughs> The same thing is true of ideas. If all your ideas are coming from the same four rooms that you live in, eventually, right, dysfunction, and they become inbred ideas. They're not powerful. It's not so much of creativity, evolution. Everything comes from the mingling of ideas. And so absolutely, it's hard. So having said that, that we absolutely must do what you're saying. We must challenge our ideas regularly. You should not give up the models that you have a track record of achievement on lightly. So it's kind of like slow to hire, quick to fire in reverse. Hmm. I am going to be slow and cautious in adopting a mental model for my life. Mental model is the word that Charlie Munger uses around this idea. Mm -hmm. Um, Shane Parrish has written two volumes on mental models. Same thing, right? We're talking about, I have Hmm. a mental model for how this thing works. You should be slow to adopt it. Scientific method. Did that really work? Or am I fooling myself? Mm-hmm. But then, did I do that right? Slow to adopt. And I think actually think it might be actually slow to change. Like if something challenges me, I'm going to lean into it, but I'm going to look for evidence before I give up that thing. Right. So it might be slow, slow. I'm, I'm, I'm evolving my thinking on this as you watch me. <laughs> you don't have to go reflect and write it down. There you go. <laughs> But it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's it's a you know be open to different perspectives and you know change potentially change your belief or whatever your goal is that you're setting out for. And then this political of, this yeah. political season, as an example, mm-hmm. I made a commitment that I read the paper every morning. I skim through the headlines now on my phone, mm-hmm. and I just went ahead and subscribed to the Wall Street Journal and the Times. Yep. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to read both. I'm going to skim through the headlines just so that I'm seeing both sides. And I can still reject some things, but now I have more perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, how do smart, reasonable people see things so fundamentally differently? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, And there's, it's true of money. It's true of so many things. The there's a book. I think it's called How I Lost a Million Dollars. Hmm. Okay. And um, it's fabulous. I think Noah Kagan recommended it, and I I had to go. We'd have to go Google search, but the fundamental is like the subtitle of the title is How I Lost a Million Dollars, and. One of the great things he said is he, he walks through this history of all these people. You know, you should only invest in mutual funds. You should be a stock picker. And there's examples of every single strategy <laughs> hitting the highest levels of achievement. Wow. Yeah. And that's the thing. It leaves people going like, okay, so yes. what's the next move? <laughs> what yeah. do I do? And, and then there's examples of all of them of failure. And so it's like, it can be a little tough, like, but a lot of times it's not that this is the only truth, but it's the truth that you will follow and that works for you. That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm an index fund investor. Mm-hmm. I could become a stock picker, I guess, but I don't really want to do it. I don't enjoy it. So I might as well just do index funds for the rest of my life and not screw it up right. by, by, <laughs> by being mediocre at something that important. I can be really good at something really simple that I also know appeals to me intellectually and I feel like it's fairly proven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know I'll keep doing it because it, I, it's easy to make automatic, whereas the other behaviors may sound great and they work for Matt, mm. but they wouldn't work for me. So that is part of that journey, right? Mm-hmm. Is on the adoption is like, okay, that sounds completely true. There's a lot of proof, but would I ever actually do that? Yeah. No, it's easy to, yeah, if you don't have these filters and you're not thinking a little bit further, maybe looking at your track record and your current frameworks. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to just jump into Thinkorswim, like an app that where you can start picking stuff or go to Wealthfront or whatever, Betterment. I'm not endorsing any, but okay, there's your maybe that's your one thing for funding, you know, uh, uh, investing. investing. Yeah. And then yeah. boom, let it let it do its work for you. <laughs> let science go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like we went way down the wormhole we on did. this one. We, so. 100% we did. And we knew it. We have it a tendency good. to do that on this show. <laughs> Well, You're my kind of people. Okay. <laughs> well, well let, let's shift topics a little bit and talk about the the one thing a little bit. You you mentioned that that Gary sort of honed in on lead generation as the one thing for Keller Williams. 
Can you sort of walk us through for like any business, for any business, for any business. Okay. Yes. So can you sort of uh, speak into that a little bit? Why would you say that's the, the one thing that every business should be focused on? So the, if you're the best ever at delivering this service or your product is better than anything else, if you don't have any customers, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times, especially in service businesses, we look up and I, I see this actually in product and digital marketers too. Mm-hmm. People go, oh, that's so-and-so. They're making a mint and their stuff is crap. Mm-hmm. Right? It's oh, like, yeah. ah, right? They're only good at marketing, but their stuff is crap. Yeah. I would never want to be that person. Mm-hmm. And that that might be true. But the, the reality is they're dismissing someone that probably has a lot to teach them. So there are people that are not creating any value that are becoming incredibly wealthy, which is not what I want to teach anyone to do because they've learned how to lead generate. Mm. They know how to market or prospect to get customers and close them for their business. And then we see people that they might posthumously win the Nobel prize, but they weren't known in their lifetime because they couldn't do it. Mm. And so I look up and as a business person, I hope you got into this business, not just to make money, but to make an impact. Mm -hmm. So whether it's money or impact, you got to have customers. Mm -hmm. And so instead of spending all of this energy, making sure that you're the the absolute best product, that is a great thing to do. You've also got to spend a lot of energy. It's either you or someone you hire to make sure that you are great at marketing or prospecting. I think of those are two things, right? Mm -hmm. I'm lead generating for this product. And it's like Gary would say, you're always in two businesses. Every business is. Lead generation business is number one. And then whatever it is you do with those leads. Mm. And the best to most timeless businesses are the ones that do both well. Mm. They know how to capture customers and they keep delivering value. And that becomes this virtuous loop where, Matt, did you hear about this amazing product? It was so great. It's the best hundred dollars I've ever spent. Now they got word of mouth and it just keeps going. But there are people, and we know them, that are really good at lead generating. Their product sucks. People say you should never buy that. It'll rip it off. But the people are still buying it today yep. because they're so good at marketing. So just realize that we've got to do both. Mm-hmm. And when you realize that, like that's probably why people are listening to you. It is one of the most valuable skills in business. A lot of people are amazing technicians or artisans. And they've not been invested in learning this skill. So whether you're doing it for your business or someone else's, it is a highly valued skill. To have. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there a point where, you know, we're talking about those folks that are really good at Legion. It's like they focused everything on that one thing in business. What's the point where, you know, because maybe they just didn't think of, okay, I'm going to create a really good product, you know, and maybe even follow up with those folks. Is there kind of like a turning point where you would suggest like, hey, maybe, maybe we should lean in over there on that part. Okay, so I address the reality. We all we all pictured some person when I kind of gave that example, right? The person who's great at lead generation that doesn't have any, not creating any real value in the world. Correct. So we all know that person. Hopefully, everyone who's listening to this, it starts with an idea, right? The reason you became an entrepreneur was, I've got this idea to make the world better. I am solving a problem. And the people who make the most money are ultimately the people who solve the biggest problems. Right. That's just it. And um, I've got Reed Hastings, and I always misquote it. That's why I've got it taped on my wall, which I, I should have it where I could read it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see it. I think it's sideways. <laughs> but the, uh, the, you always want to be in the business of selling aspirin, not vitamins. Mm. Um, I look at Matt's bookshelf, and I know that he probably takes supplements, right? Mm. Whether they're mental supplements or real supplements, because he's committed to being better. That is a very small minority of people they will buy something. Like I look at, I take my thousand milligrams or whatever of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can demonstrably tell you that's doing for me is making my pee really yellow. (laughs) We'll do that. Yeah. But I believe in the science. But if I have a headache, I take a Tylenol or an aspirin, my headache goes away. Mm -hmm. Most of the world is driven by problem solving the aspirin business. Mm -hmm. So like whenever I'm coaching my team, I'm just like, I love what you're selling. I love what you're selling. What problem are you solving? If you're not solving a problem, you're going to be on this hamster wheel forever. So I actually think that's where you start. That's not where you go back to. It has to start with this hypothesis 
that you have a problem we're solving and now you have to go lead generate for it. And I'm sure you guys teach, right? And your, your model, I have a model for digital marketing in my mind, right? You target your audience, you come up with your message, you're then going to A-B test, mm-hmm. right? What messages work before you refine and augment? Like now I'm going to throw the money. I know it works. I'm going to throw the money at it. Yep. Right. Then I've got to capture and convert. Like there's this process, whatever that mm-hmm. is. We have to A-B test our own products. That's why in tech, they have a minimum viable product. Mm-hmm. Eventually, if you have those customers, you've solved some minimum viable problem, not product, your customers and those conversations will help you evolve it and it will become a journey. Mm. I don't think anybody is going to be well served to go out. I mean, people get venture capital to do it and they're going to gold plate their hypothesis (laughs) through years of investment and then try to sell it. That's right. Well, what just happened with Quibi or whatever it was, like that was a $1.8 billion short video idea that just sank like a rock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those are brilliant people doing it, right? Happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah it's, so it's interesting. It so it's it's working backwards, really. And it comes, it's kind of like goal setting, right? It's You're kind of looking at the problem as a whole. And not only is that going to be in your messaging that attracts people, but it's it's fulfilling on that. You know, what you're attracting them for is that solution, your product, service, whatever that is. That's, that's the cycle, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, um, when we wrote The Millionaire, uh, well, when we wrote The One Thing with our publisher, when we got to a thousand reviews, um, I went on Mechanical Turk and I got someone to move every single review into a, a document so that we could analyze. And I wanted to compare five-star reviews, which was about 85% to the one star, which is like 5% or something. And it was so great. It's like, this is the end of the chain. At the end of the chain, you've delivered the service Part of what goes all the way back to the marketing funnel is what's working, what's not working. Mm. And you got to market both. Like I actually respond better to Joe, this product is probably not for you if. Yeah. Because when I'm looking at reviews online, I'm looking for the one-star reviews because if they don't like it because the batteries don't last a long time, but I've got a lifetime supply of batteries, I'm like, that's not a problem for me. I'll buy it. Mm -hmm. Right? Good point. Yeah. So both of those become rich fodder for how you then turn around and market the product. What are people loving about it? And what do people just not like about it? And if you gloss over the latter part, you actually end up with those really weird mixed reviews. I'd rather have a lot of five-star and a few one-star and nothing in between than all bunch of three-star reviews that are muddled. There's no clarity there. Mm. Good point. Yeah, it's clarity on one side or the other, and you can just refine and solve more of those problems down there. Kind yeah. of like NPS scores, you know, and whenever you have a product net promoter score, I mean, same yeah. idea. Just survey your folks and then start, you know, keep learning. Always be learning. Yeah. That's a, a, a systematic way to always be learning. I love that you use that example. It's perfect because yeah. you're really getting the top people to just trump it. Mm-hmm. It's working for them. And then below a certain threshold, you're getting what you need to know to make it better. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. We actually like, have a, a process when somebody joins our email list after a certain amount of days, something like. I don't know, two weeks in or something, they actually get a survey emailed to them that asks them what they think about the podcast, what they don't like, what they do like, what we can do better. And that's just a constantly, like everybody that goes through our system ends up seeing that survey. So there's just this constant feedback that we're getting on how to constantly improve the show, what kind of guests are working well, which kind of guests aren't working well. And we're we're just constantly course correcting. It's, you know, I like the, the analogy of the you know, the, the, the ship, the ship's never going in a straight line. You're, you're kind of going this way and then you course correct to the straight line yeah. and it veers off this way. We're just constantly course correcting to get to where we're trying to go. And, and I think that's a, you know, a really smart way to approach it. I, I would agree. I love that y'all do that. Hopefully you don't get too many negative survey results from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know right away yeah. <laughs> for your next podcast. But <laughs> Jay, you you're uninvited in the future. <laughs> Well, I I think one of the the sort of misconceptions around like the one thing concept is the one thing is the only thing, right? So we were talking about like um, lead generation, right? And then Joe was kind of alluding to like, but you need to have a good product and you need this and you need this or lead generation doesn't matter. So let's let's talk about that a little bit about like lead generation is the one thing for every business, but it's not necessarily the only thing. So, you know... I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm trying to to form a question out of this statement. I, I here, hear but- the question. Like, <laughs> okay. How do we get beyond the reality as entrepreneurs and right. self-employed people yeah. that the reality is to run any business, you have to wear a lot of hats. Mm-hmm. 
And how do I reconcile all the stuff on my to-do list with the, the handful and maybe one real priority? Mm, because perfect. there's still things that have to get done. Right. But how do I allocate? It's really about how much time we allocate for them. And so the word um, priority, if you look at the Latin root, the word is first. And so it is a little worried. It's a little weird when we say priorities. Like, would you ever pluralize first? Right. Well, I'm juggling a lot, juggling a lot of firsts today. I, I, I can't even spit it out. But so I think that the, the first domino, right? If you line up all your dominoes, do you know what's the first thing? And that's where lead generation is for almost every business. Hmm. Every day, you got to come back and ask the question. Every month, whatever your time frame is, do we have enough leads, right? If I have enough leads, I can sell enough product. If I sell enough product, I can pay my people. If I have a surplus, I can hire even higher quality or more people. And like, it becomes this amazing cycle. But it's the first step on the journey. Mm. But there are these other things. And that's where you get into your philosophies and your models. I think that um, this juggling, like what comes first, product or people? Mm. That is a chicken and egg question. Yeah. And I've heard really great people kind of lean each way. I, I lean towards people. Mm -hmm. If I have a yeah. great leader, like an artisan or whatever, like someone who's really good at what they do, those people can often make a defective product work. Yeah, They'll find the duct tape and bailing wire to make it work for their customers. They'll provide enough service until you get it right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So like, that's my sense, but I, I guarantee you there's someone listening to this going, that is so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Figure out yours and then go live that journey. As yeah. a business person, you got to focus on the front end of the funnel. And then there's all these moments of truth, right? Um, can I convert those leads? Right. It's one thing to have a pile of emails. Are they any good? Mm -hmm. Are they true prospects? Right. Can I convert them? Now, what was their experience with the service or product? Do I have to fix that, right? How do I follow up with them and get referrals for futures? You know, mm -hmm. there's this chain of events and it's not a whole bunch of stuff. And there's, there's people or categories of people that address each. And you can ask most great businesses, if you go to the top, the founder or the CEO, they don't have to have 5,000 amazing people. They have to have handful of really extraordinary people that then manage everything below them. Mm -hmm. And the more that you have those key positions surrounded by great talent, the more likely those people are to hire. I don't want to work for a schlump, <laughs> right? And so like A talent attracts A talent. C talent never attracts or keeps A talent. Right. And yeah. so that's you hearing my bias towards it. But so there's milestones and you just as a business person have to ask, do I know what the milestones in my business are? What are the moments of truth? Right. Mm -hmm. And do I have a great approach to each of them? And, and in time blocking, which ones belong on my calendar this week or today? And then you just got to just live that calendar. Um, about half of your day should be completely booked with those ongoing priorities. And because you're a business, if you book more than about 50%, you're going to be working all night or you're not going to see your family or your kids. There's a certain amount of energy we create, especially with lead generation, that's going to create chaos and dictate your priorities for the rest of the day. Mm. And if you don't have space built in, that's when stress and blood pressure go up. Mm. And so in the, and this is perfect segue because this is where I wanted to kind of end things is, is time blocking before we we're out of time here. I think we could do this in about seven minutes <laughs> yeah. uh, is uh, Jeff, you know, he brought up time blocking and a big thing. Uh, he kind of was analyzing me through me through a scenario. It was great. And he basically landed on, he's like, you know what, Joe, I think for you is perfect to have a transition time in your day every single day. And he challenged me to do it for a year. Been working so, uh, you know, so far really well, you know, 15 minutes. Just transition yeah. time right at the end, and then family time, whatever it looks, you know, whatever time works for me. Um, I guess, what are your principles when it comes to time blocking? You know, it's uh, but the one thing I know, those things should be done typically first thing in the day, right? Yes. You, you know, your energy is there, your willpower, you're not drained. I guess walk us through your principles of, of time blocking in general and how you apply that. What I've, um, there's like this idea of, do I know what my priority is in this part of my life? Do I have a time block for it? Like, have I made a time commitment to do it, which makes you so much more likely to do it? 
And then the third step, which I try to live, is can I make a habit of doing it, a ritual of doing it? So it takes some of the work out. You know, and, you know, I, I remember reading about writers and, you know, the, the, the real thing about writing is just kind of kind of show up every day. Mm-hmm. And over time, if you just commit to writing one page, it, the muscles get stronger and it comes a little faster and there might be off days, but it, it happens more frequently, mm-hmm. right? It, it is that just that weird thing. So the more important the priority, I would tell you, the earlier in the day, you should probably do it mm-hmm. because- our lives don't get simpler as the day goes on and our <laughs> energy right. doesn't get higher. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, make the mistake of trying to do their most important work like after 10 o'clock when their kids are in bed. and Because that is a quiet time in the house. It's attractive, it's also, right? Our yeah. energy is quite low and it's not healthy long term. Um, when I study really successful people, um, they get up early. They've made a habit of getting up early. And that morning time, which is equally tranquil, there's nobody calling you at 6 a.m., right? There's nothing, well, unless you are a news junkie, there's not much on TV that wasn't there last night. Like you can control that time and do a lot of really important things for yourself. So I asked the question around the seven circles. So like my wife and I kind of did it together um, because when we had kids, we did, I don't remember what book I read, said that if you make a habit of having dinner with your family, without the TV on, like there's all of these things, like your kids are less likely to do drugs because that little moment in time, they're going to actually talk to you. Mm, yeah. Right. And yeah. so we just made a commitment. Hey, um, let's turn the TV off. She hates the TV. Now I've converted her a little bit. I'm a movie <laughs> junkie. It's like, except for Friday nights, which is movie night, we try to have at least two meals, breakfast and dinner with the family at the table. Yeah. And we wanted to do a spiritual thing, which is, all right, so what's one thing we're all grateful for today? That was like our, you could pray for that, or you could just be grateful. That was like, what's our spiritual habit we want for ourselves and our kids? And we just went around those circles. Mm-hmm. And the exceptions are like, that's dinner. We're much more likely to have dinner together than breakfast, more nights, because I have teenagers on the weekends. I don't see them till noon. Yeah. <laughs> I, Let's be honest, they're I sleeping. I count on yeah. <laughs> seeing them at dinner, not for breakfast. And my wife and I get up early. Mm-hmm. So like that's, uh, we built it around the reality, not just everything in the morning, mm-hmm. but like we do date night. So my number one relationship is my wife. Mm-hmm. And when we had, we had kids 16 months apart and mm-hmm. we were struggling. One of them had colic. Our youngest daughter had colic. So it was really, if y'all have kids, you'll know that it's like, yeah. it was tough on the marriage. Gary gave me advice. Y'all should start doing date night. So as soon as we felt comfortable leaving him with the stranger, because we had no family in town, we started hiring a babysitter. In the beginning, we could only afford to do it a couple of times a month, but we wanted to make it a ritual. It's date night. Well, for the last 10 years, I'm going to say maybe 11 or 12 now, I haven't actually done the math. We have date night on Wednesday nights because we couldn't get babysitters regularly, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't want to do date night in the morning. It's really <laughs> important. So that's going to be at night because that's the nature of it. But other than those two habits, all the other ones are in the morning. We get a lot done. We get up probably between five and five thirty every day and it's not a hardship we didn't start there yeah, yeah. kids started training us to get up earlier because i'm in that had to have a, there, I'm there right now <laughs> yeah. and we just kept it yeah um and that morning time is when we read it's when we exercise together um it's when i journal um i look at my goals in the morning before i go to work that's a Jeff has taught me this. If you can look at your goals, we have a thing called a 411, which he probably talked about. Yep, did, yep. If you can look at your priorities before you open up your email and you make a habit of doing that, you'd be amazed how much better your days will go. Mm. Because now you know what you're supposed to say yes to before you get into everybody else's offers and asks. Yep. Someone else's agendas. So, yep. It's emails, yep. basically. It's, so you just look up and you, you, you interview really successful people their mornings tend to have a lot of rituals baked in and they have some other regular rituals. Habits sounds heavy and hard, mm. but they just have a rhythm that they try to keep to and they'll break it when they go on vacation. We do too, but they've kind of developed a rhythm so that these important things just kind of happen. Yeah. So I could show you my week at a glance and you would see there's space that shows up almost every single week. We probably net 45 to 50 dates a, a year. Nice. There's travel, stuff happens. We're not there or we're just too tired, mm-hmm. you know? But for the most part, that's a regular something we get to engage in our marriage. Like, can you build those habits for you and your business? Mm. That would be the, the, the end game for time blocking. Yeah. It's not every single minute of every day, 
It's just a handful of hours each week that are really dedicated to things that you really value. The rest kind of falls in place. Yeah. 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 I, I, Joe and I got some advice from somebody else. I, actually, it was somebody's show that we went on, but his advice was what you need to be focused on time blocking. Uh, when he was, th- this is probably very tailored to us, so it may not be universal advice, but sure. he, he basically said time block all the stuff that you love doing and then figure out how to make work work around that stuff. Hmm. So if you love going surfing, make sure that's on your calendar for as many times a week as you want to do surfing and then fit work around that stuff. If you really like playing guitar, which is my, my case, I like to spend a little time playing music all the time, time block that into my day and then figure out how my business works around the time blocks. And it, it kind of sounds like you have some similar philosophies there. Totally. Like mm-hmm. it, it, it's a boulder in the stream, right? In the beginning, you have to work, but it then becomes a habit. And I remember I read a study. I used to be a smoker mm-hmm. and they said, you know, it'll take you like six months to fully kick the, the addiction but it might take as long as a year for people to stop offering you cigarettes. Oh, wow. Because their habit is thinking of Matt. I'm sorry, I'm picking up you (laughs) because I'm looking at you on the screen. Like, he's a smoker. Let's go have a smoke break. Even though that's no longer your identity. And so there's this thing, you train yourself and then you train the world. And by the time your kids and your coworkers understand that, oh, Joe's an early morning guy. And hey, at six, Matt plays his guitar. So let's, I'm going to call him at seven or I'm going to call him before. The world starts to navigate that. Like mm-hmm. most of the people who work with me for any amount of time, sometimes back when we used to work together in the office, <laughs> they'd go, what are y'all doing for date night tonight? Ah, because they just cool. knew that, right? Yeah. So like my boss, like he's not going to text me in the middle of Wednesday night because he knows what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He respects so that it, you've it conditioned It's one of those him. things that happens. So whether it's surfing or whatever, um, go ahead and put that boulder in the stream. It is amazing how work will flow around it if you put it there in advance and you mm. communicate it to people. I tell my employees at the beginning of the year, go ahead and block your vacations. If you want to go to Austin City Limits concert, go ahead. Even if you don't have tickets, block it. And then we can be planning for you being gone then. But if you tell me three days before <laughs> that you locked into tickets and now you're giving me your job while you go to a concert, you're going to mm. turn me into that boss that says, no friggin' way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But if you put the boulder in the stream, it flows around it. When people mm. don't do that, they end up with a laptop at beach, a guitar collecting dust in the corner, right? Those things. You've got to you've got to make time commitments, build habits, train yourself, and then train the world. I love that. Boulder in the stream. The perfect analogy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like apply it to everything. All right, Jay. I think we uh are one minute over. Pretty much achieved that. <laughs> Nailed <laughs> okay. it. I know. Thank you so much, man. Um where's uh so I think uh, where's the best way for folks to explore more with you? We've uh, we've definitely with Jeff. We talked about the uh, the uh, sorry the retreat the virtual retreat. I think by the time yeah. this goes airs, it might be a little after. So um, sure, there's something else <laughs> that's relevant. I would just say uh, if folks like what we we're talking about, definitely go check out the one thing dot com with the number one. There's all kinds of free resources. If you missed the retreat, my wife and I've been doing it. That's one of the boulders we started putting in the stream 14 years ago. And we've done it every year for 14 years and love it Um, because we both run businesses and it's really hard to have a healthy relationship with all that chaos without making that investment. Um, That said, my last name's Papazan, you know, Um, Jay Papazan, if you Google it, there's only one in the United States. They're going to find me on Facebook or Instagram (laughs) or someplace. And that's really me. Um, (laughs) And I don't block a lot of time for those things, but I tend to play on Instagram when I'm bored because it's visual and I'm a word guy. So it feels like play Yeah, and it doesn't feel like work. Whereas Facebook is a drag for me right now. Mm-hmm. Like let's get at least through the political season before you <laughs> ask me to meet you there. <laughs> right. you're like yeah, you- connect. And if I can help, I will. I love connecting with our readers. I love serving our people. That's what I'm in the business for. I want to create value in the world. Um, and that's what the, that's the ultimate payoff. Love it. Well, Jay, thank you very much, man. You gave us a lot to think about. So, no, we thinking about that for a long time <laughs> in our thinking. Time. Uh, I'll say the same to y'all, Joe, Matt. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing me and Jeff previously with your audience. And thanks for doing what you do. I mean, for entrepreneurs, y'all are giving them wisdom around their number one thing in our belief system. So, thank you. You're welcome, man. All right, we'll talk soon. Alrighty, yes, sir, dude. 
That was a fun interview. Yeah, I really, conversation. really, I really enjoyed that conversation. I was a little concerned going into it that we would cover a lot of the same stuff that we talked about with Jeff Woods, of, mm-hmm. you know, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but we took it in totally different areas than I think even he was anticipating taking it. <laughs> <laughs> Jay did his research, which Jay, if you're listening, thank you very much for doing your research. We prep our guests and, um, and, and tell a lot of these topics mm-hmm. that, you know, our audience are looking after. So, uh, definitely. And then we had a little chat to, yeah. hopefully avoid any overlap but um there was a little overlap and i think it was great because it took in different directions so um there's just so much to apply from the one thing mm-hmm. but also just everything else that we were chatting about yeah uh with jay so um man where do we start matt what do well, you got takeaways so for me you know like my there's sort of two rabbit holes in my life right now that i've been going down like fairly heavily right um, like that, like when I have free time, this is the stuff I'm reading about researching, mm-hmm. listening to podcasts about. Right. So one of them is like health and nutrition, right? I've been mm-hmm. like really into it, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos, going down that rabbit hole. But the other one for me is knowledge management, like how yeah. to, how to read better, how to be more effective with your reading, how to like regurgitate what you read, how to retain what you read, how to have actual digital systems to store the information that you're learning so that it's easily accessible later. Like this whole knowledge management rabbit hole is something that I've been obsessed with for probably like at least a year now, maybe a little longer. Um, and so when we started talking about like how he consumes books and his processes of, of, of reading and, and basically locking in the knowledge, that was when I was like really sort of nerding out. I was like, and we started talking about like, okay, you can get into these, um, you can get into these like echo chambers where it's like, this is my belief around how this thing Mm -hmm. should work. Mm -hmm. And all you're going to do is read books that continually revalidate the thing that you already thought would work, (laughs) but you're never really looking at alternate points of view. And I think to be sort of well-rounded as a, as a person and to be well-rounded in your sort of knowledge base and the knowledge management that you're creating, you need to be pulling sources from all over the place, from all different backgrounds, from all different you know walks of life to hear the different perspectives otherwise you're just going to live in that echo chamber Mm. and i Mm -hmm. really and i know that was like actually quite a big discussion on this show which none of us were anticipating actually having but when we got into it we're like this is too good not to talk about and there was a little bit over and that's a great takeaway and that was one of my biggest ones too yeah is reading um uh, and and then you're applying to the circles remember those circles he actually referenced and this is the same exact thing that where jeff referenced page 114 yep of of the one thing so check that out to get a deeper dive into the circles and stuff but yeah and you read for the, you know that's where a lot of that stems from what are your important things in life the circles and you can read for those and i thought it was really cool with what you're talking about reading is uh you have everyone has beliefs mm-hmm. so you know you don't want to keep you want to challenge those beliefs mm-hmm. and you never you, you're not always successful a lot of these books and things that we read are just kind of saying the same things or in different words mm-hmm. and that's okay it's always going to happen even more so now with more content out there but yeah if you find something that challenges your beliefs then you have something to reflect on and kind of go deeper on and, and possibly you know change your perception and your actions mm-hmm. um yeah that was really cool so I let's see here on that point. Yeah, we went down so many. So, so one one more thing on that same point, yeah. right? So when we, I'm, I I can't remember if this was when we interviewed Marx on our show, one of the multiple times he was on our show, or when we went on Marx's uh, Marx Acosta Rubio's podcast. Um, but one of the one of the things he asked of us was when we started talking about books, he posed the question to us: When you read that book what did that book get out of you? Mm -hmm. Right. He didn't read. What did you get out of that book? Mm -hmm. He said, what did that book get out of you? Mm. And I think the first time I answered the question, I'm like, Oh, I learned a lot about this, this, and this. And he's like, no, that's what you got out of the book. What did the book get out of you? Action. Right. And that, and, and what uh, Jay was talking about on this episode was very much that when he was talking about, you need to read books for doing not don't read books for the additional knowledge. Yeah. Right. So read the books and figure out like, okay, what, 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 changes in my life and make what things am i going to start doing on a daily basis what new mental model am i going to employ as a result of this book if you can't figure out some sort of like action something that this book can get out of you is it really worthwhile and yes there mm-hmm. is something to be said to just sort of growing your intellect and sort of having a better understanding of things like we're going to read for that as well right but if you're you know if you're thinking a little more purposefully around your reading i think there's a lot of uh, benefits to that 
And I think it's also very beneficial to sort of cut books that aren't serving you pretty quickly, right? If you get yeah. a couple chapters in and you're like, I'm not getting any value in the first few chapters, ditch it and move on to another one. And he just said, yeah, he, he was saying that, you know, most of it's in what, in the first 30 pages. Yeah. Something like that. So like if you, if you, if something catches you there, then keep going. But if you really don't have something new and novel, that's going to challenge a belief or whatever you're setting out to get um, from or <laughs> what that book is going to get from you, mm-hmm. then um, and maybe it's not worth reading, you mm-hmm. know, or it could be a skimmer, I think is what he said. Um, one of the big takeaways, and this relates to the reading, but also other things, is reflection time mm-hmm. and just that thinking time. And I know he referenced Keith Cunningham as as the guy that basically, you know, dubbed that. And I think it was thinking time, putting that in your calendar. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what Jay was going to do, or probably is doing it currently. Um, <laughs> but like after we were recording, is having thinking time and similar to what Jeff was talking about transition time Mm -hmm. uh, when he was referencing me, but like there's, so putting that on the calendar sounds like, and we didn't ask him that specifically on the thinking time, but I'm sure that is a daily thing. Mm -hmm. That's probably maybe multiple times a day, depending on what he's doing prior to that. Well, even with uh, Perry Marshall too, he he talks about his Renaissance time being a non-negotiable in his day to days in the morning. He calls it Renaissance time and that's his thinking time, his reading time, his, Sort of like meditating, meditating that, that kind of thing, or moving about. Yeah, and that's similar to what Jay was saying, and that's that's kind of where I was I was leading to a little bit. It's like you know, the high achievers are typically morning people; they're mm-hmm. early morning people. And luckily, I'm being forced kicking and screaming mm-hmm. into waking up at like six every morning. Uh-huh. Uh, but I am liking it. I, I do feel more accomplished, and I actually end up working a little sooner, but not always doing work stuff. It's I feel like it is actually more of the important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, like, <laughs> it's th- that's where the important stuff just really comes out. So, uh, you know, time blocking that, I mm-hmm. think, is he's like, if it's not in the calendar, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. And I, I think it was another uh, s- something I read from um, Jay or heard on a podcast, but and he kind of lightly mentioned it. But, you know, he even time blocked working out yeah. on his uh, at home when he had kids or has kids, but younger kids with his wife. And like actually brought the trainer to his house. And that's the only way they were able to do that actually turned out to be good for the relationship. All that to say is time blocking things around fun, Mm -hmm. which is something that Marx said. And you reference that for family Mm -hmm. thinking time. And like, really, that's it. That's the most important stuff. Yeah. And I feel like that's uh, we all have time in the days to to do that. Yeah, we have enough hours in the day to actually do it. Just just time block it. Yeah. Put it on the calendar. Totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is just a random realization has nothing to do with Jay specifically, but this random realization that like one of my favorite things to do in these like outro portions mm-hmm. is to interrelate various podcast yeah. episodes, like yeah. to, to, to look at like what we just talked about and, and in my brain go, okay, who else did we talk <laughs> about similar things with? And how can we connect the dots between what we just learned from this person to things that other people talked about on the podcast? It's like, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, it's just a realization of like, my this is how my brain works is like what can i relate this discussion to uh through Both, other yeah. things <laughs> this is how uh this outro can go even longer because mm-hmm. you and i both think that way yeah. it's like we interconnecting all of these things and people and topics and yeah i mean there's there's a lot um which it's also fun. allows listeners to go oh i want to go deeper down that rabbit hole maybe i should go listen to jeff woods maybe i should go yeah. listen to marx acosta rubio maybe i should go listen to perry marshall yeah <laughs> yeah you, and you should yeah <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they'll be linked in the show notes we'll see yeah. uh, but either way yeah search him up because yeah jay is absolutely amazing i mean the other one of my big takeaways actually and i it, it, it's essentially to read jay's other book with um with uh, gary keller uh, the millionaire real estate agent yeah I didn't think that was relevant. Well, to they me. also seem to have a book called the real estate, the, the millionaire real estate investor, because I saw it in the background That's of his video. Right. But so, they also have the millionaire real estate agent. Yeah. And I think agent was the one specifically that was more like for networking, for um, scaling and growing a service. Like really you said at the end of the day, like that's, it's it's people yeah it's collaboration it's how to you know basically do that effectively yeah, yeah. brad spencer recommended that book to me mm-hmm. he he said um and he's not in the real estate world right? right but he said that that was one of the best books on like networking and connections and getting to know people and then we mentioned that book when we had uh sam karamian on from the one thing mm-hmm. or uh from uh big block big block realty yeah and he said oh that's the bible he said if you're in real estate you've read that book everybody yeah. in real estate's read that book and what's all real estate it's connections it's yeah. people you're doing deals man so 
I mean, that's that that could get applied to everywhere. Yep. And I know mean, for us, selfishly, it definitely applies. Doing affiliate marketing stuff, collaborating, partnering. Yeah. Um, po- podcasting. So yeah, that was one of my takeaways: is the millionaire real estate agent. Um, actually read that book because it's not just for real estate agents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so, a good takeaway. Um, one one thing that might be kind of cool is like, what's like something from the what what is this episode going to get out of you like what's one thing and i mean for you you just said you're gonna go pick up that book and and start reading that i would say the bigger oh maybe not bigger thing but another thing is time blocking more so yeah Uh, and i have started that because of jeff woods and and i do so here's the thing it's like is actually committing to what i put on the calendar because i will be honest right now we have every monday night i have a date night on the calendar for my wife and i heather Mm -hmm. um we have not been doing them mainly because of and this is an excuse i'm sure we can get around it is because of the the, the covid stuff yeah because that that was gonna and we because we put it on the counter before like that's when we're gonna go out to dinner and all that still can by the way yeah and we can make that happen but i will uphold that commitment i'll start there well even if it's like giving the baby to the in-laws and ordering exactly in together right. you that's, know <laughs> yeah, yeah or like it's like hey baby go down the hill to the yeah. in-laws for an hour or two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we need to get food. it on. I mean, uh, we need <laughs> well, to eat yeah. some food. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, like, we'll see where that goes. <laughs> but like, that's the thing is honoring what's on my calendar because it is easy to just be like, make excuses. Yeah. So I want to honor that because that is the most important thing mm-hmm. and uh, and apply those circles, like kind of the whole one one fourteen page 114 in the one, in, uh, the one thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah. No, I, I think for me, it's, it's really like the the knowledge management stuff. Like he was sort of reaffirming some of the changes that I've been making lately. Like I have a lot of books. I mean, if you ever watched our videos, there's a big bookshelf behind me and it's not even all my books. My other office has a shelf full of books too. Um, (laughs) and and I actually have my fitness books out in my garage. So I read a lot of books. Um, but the the way I've always read them is I actually feel guilty if I like stop a book halfway through, like I'll get like halfway through and never put it on the shelf and start another one. And I'll be like, I really should finish that one. But if I only got halfway through and lost interest, then it, wasn't providing very much for me right so um that sort of philosophy of like you know just sort of give up on books a little bit quicker like use it for like, <laughs> yeah. is this book going to get something out of me yes or no no okay i've, I've given it enough of my head space say, is that a uh, is that making the book sad if it's not getting anything out of you is that what you're worried about? i don't care about the book's feelings oh, okay <laughs> i just didn't know that's why <laughs> why you feel bad at stopping <laughs> no it's more my own mental thing it's yeah, more it's no, more I of like know. a giving up kind of thing yeah you know? no I get, it. I get it well maybe just do a skim yeah just do a quick skim and see if like just skim titles and headlines and stuff yeah and maybe the little passage at the end that says here's the Here's the recap from the chapter. And uh, oh, yeah, my favorite no more bo- worries. My favorite books are the one where at the end of each chapter, they're like, here's a Summary. recap of what we just said in this chapter. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. You just saved me all the work of reading that chapter. <laughs> I mean, if those catch you, then go deeper. But if they don't, then okay. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Those are good takeaways. Yeah. Jay is amazing. Is amazing. Uh, go to the one thing dot com. It's the number one. Yep. And uh, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. There's a lot of freebies, a lot of events they do, virtual stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, go check it out. He's mm-hmm. awesome. Yep. And um, if you want to grab the notes from this episode, yes. uh, go over to our Facebook group over at flowchartgroup.com. Uh, when you sign up for the group, that's how you get the notes. We'll give you the notes for to the people who sign up to our Facebook group and yeah. join it. So Go uh, say hi in the group. Yeah. Nice request to join. join. Say hi. We uh, interact with people. Uh, there's a lot of great members in there. A lot of great advice. We share a lot of cool videos. We do live streams to the group all the time. And you can get the companion notes to this episode by doing that. And you might meet some guests that we've had on the podcast as well. So you can actually ask them questions directly. That's cool. Um, So yeah, go there, flowchartgroup.com. And also we have our sponsor as uh, Easy Webinar. And if you're thinking about doing webinars or if you're doing webinars and you're like hacking it together with like Vimeo and like click funnels or like landing pages, all these things. (laughs) And it's like, yep, I'm doing webinars, but you're not really doing webinars. Like you might want to look into Easy Webinar because... They make it easy and you can do any kind of webinar and essentially it builds those pages for you as well. So it's taking some steps out of your, uh, you know, your process there and automating a lot more. Yeah. And so, he's got a discount for listeners. He does. He's hooking you up. There's uh, some pretty fat percentage points taken off the price point. Yeah. So go check it out at easywebinar.com slash hustle. Easywebinar.com slash hustle. Go get it. Thank you, Casey and team. And go share this episode with some folks. Some people that you think will get something. You know somebody. You're listening right now going, I know somebody that can use this episode. Think about it. So think about that person and send it to them. Who do you think that is? I'm asking. 
you'll be giving them a lot of value. You do need some time blocking. Who needs a little bit of a, who's a little scattered feeling, but feels like they need to get a little further. That's yeah. the person. Yeah. Or if they like going down the knowledge management rabbit hole, sure. like I do, <laughs> then this film as well. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. For taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out all the good stuff from this episode we actually have a nice simple notes version that you can find on our website so go to evergreenprofits.com find this episode that you just listened to and uh, give us your email address and we'll send you the notes thanks for listening